people from all walks of life came to John to be baptised and John was baptising them to cleanse them mm -hmm. from their sins. So when Jesus came, it, it raises that question of, well, why? He didn't need to be cleansed in that sense. I, I guess as a lay minister, you wouldn't have actually done baptisms. No, that's right. The only sort of um, sacramental type service that I can do because I was given special training was burying. So I can bury people. They don't have to be dead first, but I'm, I'm licensed to bury people. You could almost say that every Sunday we, we, we are going down into the water. We rise to new life. A lot going on um, with this. <laughs> Welcome to Pray Tell. Uh, my name is Trevor. I'm Tyler. And uh, we are two uh, parishioners here at uh, St. Matthew's in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Um, we like to uh, sit down, uh, chat about what we like about the Anglican tradition and things we've learned and just what we think makes uh, Anglicanism uh, a really a net benefit uh, for people who choose to attend and specifically for us as well. And at the same time, we like to um, crack a couple of beverages and enjoy those at the same time. Indeed. The purpose of this podcast is more or less to just provide a space to talk about our experiences uh, as Christians, uh, as Anglicans, um, what we what we like to what we like about the Anglican Church and the Anglican tradition, and just to provide a forum for uh, Anglicans and um, I guess non Anglicans uh, to explore certain ideas, uh, talk about their faith, uh, and and just have kind of a, a thoughtful time. This episode we're talking about. Uh, baptism, uh, baptism uh, in the in the church more broadly, but then also the Anglican take or perspective on on baptism itself. And here to help us talk about this today is another parishioner from St. Matthew. Uh, so we have uh, invited Dick Martin to come and join us today and speak on this topic. So welcome, Dick. Hi there. Dick, why don't you tell us a bit about your background and who you are and how you came to be here today? Well, I'm kind of fresh off the boat. Well, I've been here about uh, just coming up to five years here in Canada. We emigrated, my wife and I, um, back in 2019, just in time for COVID, which is bizarre, really. Oh, lovely. Um, but I've, we've got a lot of family over here on Trisha's side. So we've, we've uh, threw all of our um, possessions in one of those big steel boxes and shipped it over here. And we've settled finally in Abbotsford. Um, back end of 2019, we settled here. And driving up and down the road, we came past St. Matthew's several times mm -hmm. um, as we went down to Home Depot to pick up paint to do all the decorating <laughs> in the house. And then one day we came in and we uh, we bumped into Paul Tyson, who showed us around the church. And then on the way back with a trunk full of paint, we stopped and had a long chat with Father Alan and decided this was the place for us. So that's the beginning of a four-year story of being associated with uh, St. Matthew's. Back in the UK, I was what they call a, a lay reader, which is a, a slightly odd name because really what it is is a, is a lay minister or an assistant minister. Um, the equivalent, I suppose you could say, of a, of a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant mm. or a warrant officer, not, not a priest, but somebody who's able to preach and take services and function as a support person for, mm -hmm. the, for the incumbent. Um, now, that, that's been something that we followed up with a little bit here in, in Canada in a more informal way. Uh, every now and again, I help out with services as and when the need arises. Um, but I'm in, in some senses, I'm semi-retired really, but, um, I've, I've been to a lot of churches, seen a lot of things. And when you, when you say, when you use that term lay reader, the, the term lay really, really is a way of signaling that you're, you're not ordained. Not ordained. So you're not a priest and you're not a deacon who are both ordained mm, positions within right. the church. Uh, but you're, you're given certain authority and certain abilities by, by the bishop and by the diocese to, carry out certain types of services. Yes. Licensed. And licensed. It's a licensed ministry. Licensed. Yeah. Well, great. Um, how long did you do that uh, before you, in the formal way back in the <laughs> Church of England? Uh, started in 1982. Oh. So however many years that is, it's quite a lot, isn't it? When you think many. about it. Yes. 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 I've been, been doing that for quite a while. And, and we asked you to come on the show specifically because of some of that background ability and your ability um, to, to speak into the, um, the, the views and the, and the ways of baptism being done in the Anglican church, I, I guess as a lay, lay reader, lay minister, you wouldn't have actually 
done baptisms, or am I right on that? No, that's right. No, you can't. You can't do that. Um, uh, the only the only sort of um, sacramental type um, service that I can do because I was given special training was burying. Um, okay. So I can bury people. They don't have to be dead first, but I'm I'm licensed to bury people. Okay. So yes, I can I can do funerals and uh, that's a cool rest. license, I think. <laughs> so no um, baptisms, marriages. I ha- actually, funnily enough, I have married somebody, but I we had a registrar there to do the civil part of the ceremony, and I basically took the, the marriage service. Okay. So that we did. I have done that once, but that's that's unusual. Good. Well, I think before we get into things here, should we crack them? Yep. All right. So this week um, we have this. Blood Orange Wheat Ale from Trading Post Brewing in Langley. They're also in Abbotsford. Mm-hmm. I think I might have had this one before, something similar, but it sounds good. It does sound um, good. It sounds like a really great summer or spring beer. Yeah, and I think today is the last day of our little summer episode in the spring in yeah. the Fraser Valley. Yeah. Going back to the cool weather, but yeah. beautiful today, so that's great. Let's crack them. Let's crack them. Dick, cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers. What do you think? It's good. I think um, I just finished my coffee uh, <laughs> 10 minutes before, so it's I got to like have a bit of a palate cleanser, mm-hmm. uh, but it is good. It's uh, not too sweet, but it is definitely got some blood orange, some citrus. Yeah. It's good. Very good. So, Dick, our episode today is on baptism. If Why don't you just give us a quick or long rundown on, on baptism, a uh, summary of kind of where the tradition comes from, uh, some of its roots, and how it kind of plays itself out within within our, our, our tradition. Well, the roots of it go back, the roots of baptism go back to the, certainly to the New Testament and before that. Um, we, see, we see baptism being a sign of um, a number of things. In one sense, it's cleansing. So the water itself, being water, is a, is a, a medium for cleansing things. And so um, when Jesus was baptised, um, he went to the River Jordan. Um, John the Baptist, the famous um, prophet of New Testament times, was baptising people to cleanse them from their sins. Um, but also um, going down into the water and then coming back up again is a symbol of rebirth as well. So there's there's mm-hmm. multiple levels of understanding of what baptism is. Um, and within the church, uh, it is also very much a symbol for the church overall, that this person, this or this, this child or this this young person or the, or even an adult is is coming into full membership of the church. Now, one of the nice things about St. Matthew's is that you can just pitch up at St. Matthew's on a Sunday, um, sing the hymns, follow the worship, come up to the front, take take the, the bread and the wine, sit down. Nobody nobody jumps on you. Mm-hmm. It's a very non-jumpy church. Mm-hmm. Nobody nobody sort of puts you under any pressure. And, and you can sort of be like that and just sort of become a part of that community. Join us on a Wednesday if you want to for our social time as well. Um, join us after the service for coffee and feel very comfortable and welcomed. I mean, it's a very, very welcoming church. And I think that's what a lot of people say about us. Um, no pressure, no pressure. But then sometimes people sort of begin to feel, well, I, I need to, I need a little bit more. So I need to feel more, more involved with the community and more at one with the community. And baptism is, is a way of doing that. It's, it's a membership right, if you like. Do you remember years and years ago, if people were doing like a, like a cruise to Australia, you, when you cross the equator, there would be some sort of crazy festival on the ship, wouldn't there? And there would be sort of a lot of water and dressing up and all that sort of thing mm-hmm. because an initiation to the fact that you've crossed the equator. Well, we kind of don't do it quite like that. But we do, we do a sort of a, 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 a means of ensuring that people feel that they are now part of the membership of the church, 
full membership of the church, and also the church itself then recognises that that's the that's what that person is. They've they've crossed crossed that that little Rubicon. They've they crossed the equator. They're now a member of the church. So there's and then you can think about it in all sorts of different ways. But that's essentially mm -hmm. what baptism is for us, as it was for Jesus being baptized in the Jordan, as it was for the early church who initiated baptism as a as a rite pretty well from the get go. They they would go out as 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 Paul did, as Peter did, they would they would meet new people who would accept Jesus, and then they would be baptized. It was a sign: water, water, death, death to sin, rising to life. It's interesting that you mem mention membership. That just reminds me of um, as a, I guess like a teenager or young adult um, at the church I grew up going to. Um, there were membership forms that you would have to f complete if, and there was like a whole membership class and I, and I just didn't understand it. I was like, I have gone to this church since the week I was born. People know who I am. My family's been here for years. Why do I need to fill out a membership form? I've been baptized by someone in this church. Like, and it just really didn't make a lot of sense to me, but hearing you explain baptism in that way as that is your membership or welcoming or whatever, however you want to think of it into the church, that makes um, more sense to me. Yes. So thank you for explaining it like that. Yeah, I'm thinking that you're, you're, the way that you relate to the church could be on several levels. As I said, you can just just turn up and be part of the community and and not get too involved, but, but still enjoy and be welcomed by the other people. But then there's that those people want to go to the next level. They want to begin to understand. So baptism is also an opportunity to then start to understand your Bible a bit better, to sort of understand the the more more of the Christian faith and what it really means, and more of a commitment. So you're committing yourself now to the church in a little bit more, and that may well then come out in ways in which you might um, offer yourself a service in the church as well. But that's the good thing about the church. Nobody's forced to go to these other levels. You just naturally gravitate through it um, as you as you sort of are, are welcomed by the church, loved by the church, and feel part of the fellowship. So I, I think one interesting part about the Anglican Church, and we're, we're, it's not exclusive to the Anglican Church, but in our tradition, we will uh, baptize infants mm -hmm. who who would not be, who would certainly not be thinking of in the, on the same terms in terms of involvement in the church. Um, but we, we still have the tradition and we, and we still, it's an important part of the, uh, the right. So can you talk a little bit about how that, what you just talked about in terms of membership and involvement kind of squares up with infant baptism? Mm -hmm. We, um, we did an infant baptism some years ago and um, the, the couple were fairly committed to the church and they wanted their, their little boy to be fully immersed in the water. So we filled up the font with warm water and we they sat the little kid in this and then um, the priest sort of went sort of boom, like that, dropped him into the water, head right down into the water and brought him up and the kid sort of went like that as if to say, what did you do that for? Um, that's not normally what we do. Um we can do that, but um, normally, normally the water is just sprinkled on the child, um, who may well start screaming blue murder, or they may just wonder what's going on, sort of look around, slightly dazed. Mm -hmm. The what you actually have at an infant baptism, you have the parents and you have godparents, and they are integral to what's going on because they are taking on the commitment and the promises on behalf of the child. Right, who may who may be five or six years old, not necessarily just an infant. Um, so what you're doing is you're introducing um, a group of support people around that child, mm -hmm. who are then going to and they promise to bring that child up in the Christian faith to teach, to to nurture, to protect, um, and to be be the sort of um, support team for that child as they as they develop. And as they begin to understand the the basic Bible stories, first of all, and then more about what, what the Christian life is all about. And then ultimately, um, when the time is right and when when the the child has turned into, a, say, a young teen, a teenager or a young adult, and they, they want to, they can then go forward in, in our in our Anglican church for something called confirmation. Right. 
where basically they take all of those promises that were, that were made by the godparents and the parents and take them to themselves. Mm -hmm. They take those promises upon themselves and they take control of their Christian life going forward with support from other people as well. Yeah. But they're saying, yes, what you did for me when I was three months old, I now take on myself mm -hmm. as a young adult or as, or as a, or as a full grown adult. doesn't matter really. Um, so there's a, there's a two stage process there with it, with, um, with, with, with children, yeah. but it's the children, the, the parents and the godparents are integral to that process. I remember when, um, we were, before we had our oldest daughter baptized, we kind of went through this process and, and, you know, my wife and I both came from, uh, the, the, a free church background, uh, Baptist, not a not non-denominational sort of style of worship. And, and, you know, I, I said the prayer, you know, to be saved when I was five or six years old and then was baptized when I was 14 or 15, I think. And, um, as we were going through the process of learning about infant baptism and having Lily baptized when she was one or so, um, one of the people walking us through, uh, talked about, uh, there's this guy named uh, D.I. Pat. D.I. Packer, I think his name is J.I. J.I. Packer. I think it's J.I. He was a professor at Regent College for years and years. And he talked about how in the free church model, you essentially have uh, a dry baptism and a wet confirmation is essentially how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, but what 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 we do is we have a, a wet baptism and, and a dry confirmation. And that is the, the essential where it, it reflects what's happening in other models too. You just, you have this time where you kind of, take something that's given to you and adopt it as your own. And that happens over years and years, but it is, it is, you know, an essential feature of maybe in the experience of all Christians, especially Christians who grow up in the church and who adopt their faith for their own later on. Tyler, you mentioned when we were doing our Advent series, um, when we were talking about some of the things that um, initially drew us um, to the Anglican tradition, one of them was your, um, kind of being convinced that infant baptism was one of the things to do. Like you really, you, you really in, were interested in it. So, yeah. um, why was like, what, what was it about that, that practice that piqued your interest or really kind of made you want to commit not only to baptizing, uh, having your oldest baptized, but also like committing to attending, um, an Anglican church. So what, it, what it ended up being for me was, um, as I, cause in, in, in the, in my upbringing, I would regularly see, and as part of a service, we would have, um, child dedication services mm -hmm. where a newborn baby or a recently born baby would be brought up to the front by their parents. They would be held by the pastor. They would be prayed over. They would be, um, the charges would be put on the parents to raise them in certain ways and, uh, and to, uh, help them to grow in their faith and, and to believe in Jesus Christ and all those things. And at some point I watched that and I thought, just do it already. Mm -hmm. Just baptize them. That's what you want to do. It's, it's essentially what, what you are saying should happen. You just have a certain theological or, or pragmatic disposition to, 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 to only have quote unquote believers baptism and not that there's anything wrong with believers baptism. I just remember thinking at the time, this is clearly what you want to do. And there's a precedent for it. There's, there was a, there is, and was a tradition set up for it. So I just thought, I think this is what, what everyone wants to do. Mm -hmm. So, so I kind of walked towards that tradition in the Anglican church because it, it does mirror the, the service, the baptism service that we do that's in the book of alternative services um, is a very robust version of that same dedication service. It just goes one or two steps beyond it. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you marry that tradition up with the idea of confirmation, um, I think it becomes a very powerful model for witnessing and, and assisting children and, and, and adult believers as well into what, what faith looks like, what practicing your faith and, and 
obeying Jesus Christ and and living uh, uh, the life of a Christian actually actually looks like. The service that we use from the um, the alternative service book, um, there is a series of of commitments that are made by the parents and the godparents, and then are echoed by the the congregation as a mm-hmm. whole. So, for, so for the the church overall, when when we do a baptism, it's quite a good way in which we redeclare our own faith, even even if we're not a parent mm-hmm. or a godparent. Yeah, it, there's a sort of roundness and a sort of collectiveness about that service, where we we all make commitments and remind ourselves of the commitments that we've made. It's um it's a very nice. Mm-hmm. Nice is not a very strong word. It's a very appropriate mm-hmm. type of service that we do. Well, and I think even in that service, the congregation as a whole is charged mm-hmm. with um, witnessing and holding people accountable to the promises that parents and godparents are making and to hold themselves to be accountable for the child themselves, which I think is a, a powerful model for thinking about how communities and parents raise children. I think it's a commentary on um, society in a, in a general way of, of the difference of opinion in the, in the Anglican tradition and other traditions about who actually raises children, um, whether it's just parents or is it whether it's bigger than that. And I, I think it's bigger than that. And I like how... Um, the service kind of brings everyone's attention to the fact that this is bigger than just what parents do. Because if it was just parents, then there'd be more likelihood for failure because being a parent's hard <laughs> and you, you need help <laughs> as, as we all know. I think it's the role of the, one of the roles of the church that I think is, is understated sometimes is the role the church should have in supporting young families. Mm -hmm. That's something I want to see us develop in our church is, Mm -hmm. is is more effective support for the young families because we're incredibly lucky that we have so many in our church. Um, They, um, and also I think one of the things about the baptism is that it shows the value that we're giving to children. They're not. They're not just in the way. There was a very famous report written about about the way that the church deals with children some years ago, called "Children in the Way." And are they in the way in the in the in the, church, in the Christian way, or are they just in the way? Get out of the way. Yeah. And really, it's so important for us to value the fact that we have these all these kids swarming all over the church on a, after coffee, eating all the cake. But heck, they're there. That's so important. They're there. And they're an important, well, I'm, I'm always very biased, you know, Trevor and I will be very biased in this, in this opinion because we're, we're the parents with young children. Um, but I, I think that church is not just for the old and it's not just for the young. Everyone benefits by having, uh, slices of different demographics, all kind of weaving and mingling around in the life of the church, whether that means you have some screams during the Eucharist, occasionally that happens, or a nice, nice, nice quiet time at other times. Um, it all is a net, it's a benefit to everyone, um, subject to some extremes. Well, it seems like more and more churches uh, these days, children are, for lack of a better word, removed from the service before you even start. Like, you you arrive, you check in your child with the child care or the Sunday school, and then you pick them up after. And that's f- Sunday school is a, a good thing for them to do. But um, something that I, since we have had kids, I something I appreciate about what we do here is we have our, our children's message, and that might be you doing it, Dick. That could be like Belinda mm-hmm. uh, last week or, or the priest. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have, you know, depending on the Sunday, we have godly play afterwards, but we come back to participate in that service um, at, at, the, at the Eucharist. So I still like that even though we have this, this separate time for children to go learn, um, they do get to come back and participate. And it's not just a, a drop off mm-hmm. for an hour and then the parents get to sit and, and listen and then we pick them up at the end. Well, and it's very naive to think that children care about the same things that adults mm-hmm. care about in the in the 
play and how a service plays out. Like it would, it would be a disservice to everyone if it was just a free for all, mm-hmm. like because because adults of all different stages of life want to hear about different things than children do, um, and so creating venues for those things to be, uh, to, venues and environments for those things to be talked about in a, a quiet, calm way, um, is great, um, but it's all about I think the purpose of the separation if it's going to happen and, and also recognizing that it doesn't always have to, you don't always have to separate everyone. There's value to everyone being together, even if it's very different. Well, Um, let's be honest. How often have you gone home and thought, I remember what happened in Godly play today because of this, this and this, but I forgot what the sermon was about. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Dick, you mentioned at, at the kind of beginning of our time talking about, Kind of the roots of baptism and how it goes back to um, uh, Jesus's time and even further back than that. And you talked about how Jesus was baptized himself. And one of the things that we know about baptism is one of its symbols is is uh, a, a symbol of cleansing, uh, of cleansing uh, away from sin. But um, that doesn't seem to kind of line up with what we know and what we think about Jesus in that he was. Uh, the the one and only sinless human being. Um, so can you kind of square up what you think about like how how the symbolism or or how that was working in terms of what else was going on with Jesus' baptism? Sure. Um, I suppose at one level you could just say, well, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> but yes, clearly Jesus didn't need to be baptized by by John. In the sense that the the crowds that were coming, soldiers, Romans, some of them Romans, certainly um, people from all walks of life, came to John to be baptized, and John was baptizing them to cleanse them mm-hmm. from their sins. That's that's what he was doing. That's what he announced that he was doing. Um, so when Jesus came, it, it raises that question of well, why? why why did Jesus come? He didn't need to be cleansed in that sense. Um, but there's a, a lot of lot going on. Um, it, with this, I think in one sense it was Jesus sending a signal to the people that were there that he was coming to their level, he was cleansing himself from his sin, he was preparing himself for his ministry, um, he was going from there into the desert to fast and we're in the season of Lent so we remember that 40 days of of retrospection in the desert that Jesus did. So he was preparing himself in that sense but I think also um Writers such as Joseph Ratzinger have said that there's there are two things going on with baptism. You go down into the water. That's a symbol of cleansing. It's also a symbol of death. So Jesus going down into the water, Jesus was, it was like a prequel to mm. his crucifixion. Mm-hmm. He goes down into the water. Um, we would say dying to sin. Jesus came up out of the water as a symbol for raising, being raised, raised again on the third day, a resurrection to new life. So the same thing is is true of our Christian life. Um, we need to to go down and get rid of, and our sinful nature needs to needs to die, so that we can rise to a new type of life. And that's what Christianity is all about: it's a new type of life. We're mm-hmm. rising to a new type of life. Um, mind you. Um, we leak. Um, if we're filled with the Spirit, I know that one person once said, yes, I've been filled with the Spirit, but I leak. And <laughs> so, yes, we need to constantly, as we do every Sunday, um, ask for forgiveness of our sins. In a sense, you could almost say that every Sunday we we, we are going down into the water, we rise to new life. Um, but so Jesus was showing, uh, as the disciples would understand much later on, about his death and his resurrection, dying to sin um, as we should, although Jesus was sinless. He was mirroring that for us, rising again to new life. Mm. A lot going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And today there are people who go to the Jordan River on these, on these, you know, on a coach full of, uh, a bus full of people, turn up, they put on a white robe, they go down into the water, um, and that robe. And these are mostly people from Eastern Europe. That robe will be kept for their burial shroud. It's a very, very emotional, yeah. very emotional thing that they do. Um, so yes, so people still go and get themselves immersed in the river, the River Jordan, which will be quite warm. Now, I, 
back along, I can remember that we did some um, river baptisms back in England, where we came from, in the River Tamar, which had been freezing cold. <laughs> so I'm glad we never, I never did that myself. <laughs> I was I was baptized in the Nanaimo River on Vancouver Island, which yeah. is mountain, yeah, fresh water, <laughs> glacial in fed. the middle of July, and it, it's numbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, within, so I, I was. You just mentioned that you were immersed. Mm -hmm. You're dunked. Yep. When you were baptized. That's what happened to me. Uh, was that what happened to you? No, I was a I was a, a very sweet looking kid um, in a long dress <laughs> when I was back. Yes, the, the photographs of it is hysterical. I had this long sort of baptismal yes. dress that I was. The, the, that was what I was baptized in. I was so I grew up. Um, I was born in Manitoba, but most of my family is back in Newfoundland. And so after I was born, um. I was brought back to Newfoundland to have a, a dedication ceremony in my my grandma's Pentecostal church. But in that in that service, they still did kind of like they still called it like a christening service. Mm -hmm. And I had to wear as a you know infant a long white dress. But I wasn't baptized. But it was just uh, it was <laughs> there it was a weird thing. It was a weird place. Um but yeah, I I was, I was, when I was actually baptized, I was eventually dunked, but all of my kids who've been baptized so far, uh, have been, it's just the water's been poured over their head mm -hmm. back into the baptismal font. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the reason for the difference? Um, why people might choose to do different things? Is it practical or theological or what do you think about that stuff? I, th I think it's down to down to local churches and their traditions. I mean, the tradition is a little a little uh, piece of shell mm -hmm. um, uh, with some uh, used to to lift up some of the water, hold the child with its head over the over the font, and then three times with the with that little shell. Yeah. Um, but you know, I've I've seen kids sort of sat in the font and they sort of sit there splashing the water and wondering where the rubber duck is, and um, yeah. So. In a way, it's down to the parents and what they want. And we, we again, back to the flexibility of, of the Anglican Church. We can accommodate different ways of doing these things. And also the kids, because some kids will scream blue murder at the first touch of water on them. Others will just sort of wonder what's going on and yeah. be quite sort of bemused by it all. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, can, we, can, we, can, we can cope with, diff with, with different ways of doing things. And I suppose to a certain extent, the... Um the differences of the, the different ways of administering it reflect the different um, lenses at which you can view baptism or the different interpretations of it that come to us through scripture and practice. There's, there's the cleansing element, there's the death and resurrection element. There are other elements as well. And the different practices kind of reflect the, the various ways of thinking about baptism. Yeah, in a way, um, the Ash Wednesday service which she had recently was almost like a baptism in that we were we were ashed, weren't we? We were given a sort of ash cross on our forehead. Yeah. Um, it's another symbol of, of our devotion. So we've talked a little bit or touched on this um, topic of confirmation, which is what often will come after uh, baptism, maybe as a young adult or a, a older child. Uh, our oldest daughter was baptized when she was a, just under a year old, and she's now uh, three. So maybe at some point down the road, um, when she's a little older, she'll go through this confirmation process. But why would someone want to take on confirmation? Um, what is its kind of role um, for someone who's an active member participant in a in St. Matthew or an Anglican church? I mean, the traditional role of confirmation is that you can't take the communion until you're confirmed. That would have been the sort of slightly old-fashioned way of doing things, and perhaps some of us grew up with that as the tradition of the church. And what I like about the way in which the church has evolved in that we're, we're no longer um, so so rigid about that. These days, um, if, if you are if you're in, in a good relationship with God as an adult um, or you just want you're there with your parents, you can come forward, you can have the bread, you can have the wine, and we, we don't put up barriers in that sense. But um, 
one of the important things then for for young people when they're getting through their into their elder, elder teens or or their their um, their twenties is to take on the promises that were made on their behalf when they were baptized as an infant. Take those promises on to themselves and become a member of the church. In well, you're already a member of the church through baptism, but to be a, a, an active and adult member of the church to to fully partake. Um, in all senses, in the communion, um, to fully partake in the life of the church, um, to join the church council. Good, good heavens, yes. Um, <laughs> perhaps we should have some teenagers on the church council. I'm, yeah, that's a revolutionary thought there. But um, no, you're 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 becoming the the fully adult member of the church when you when you're confirmed. You're also um, checking. We do something. We started doing something called using a catechism, which is really just a sort of um, Christianity 101. It, it sort of makes sure that you've covered all the bases as to what the church is, what Jesus, who Jesus was, what he did, what he accomplished, um, how the church functions. Um, understanding the basics is, will be the preparation that we would go through now um, for being um, confirmed. It makes sure you've covered the bases. Mm-hmm. There's, no, there's nothing terribly, terribly scientific or difficult about it, um, but you've covered the basics of what it is to be a Christian, to work, to work within the church, to be a member of the church, and what the church's role is in society overall. Um, so you, you know, you've you've got the basics there now, and you've, there's nothing left um, unt- undiscussed in your in your in your training or prepar- preparation for confirmation. So. Is uh, is there like a class someone would do then for confirmation? Like I'm just actually remembering now. I don't think I actually did this, but I friends that I grew up with that were baptized as teenagers maybe did like a little, almost like a like a class, but not quite a class. Maybe like a a meeting or two with the pastor or, or someone, and they it was almost like a confirmation, but it was definitely not called confirmation because I grew up in an non-denominational church so but how would what would what would be that process then well we we've just done one um which we completed at the back end of last year um which was probably longer than it needed to be but it was something like 12 sessions mm-hmm. um which we were meeting after church and we had a we had a little booklet which we went through um we discussed it we read it um debated it so that we, we again we'd we'd covered those basics. Um, that was one way of doing it. But there's no there's no one way. I've I've done confirmation classes um, with 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 teenagers in a, in a house of an evening. Yeah. Um, there's there's all sorts of ways of doing it. Um, and I suspect that that um, one could do it as a Zoom thing. Although now with with COVID hopefully out of the way, we can we can do things. In person, I think after the service on a Sunday worked worked actually really well right. for when we did that because um, it was convenient for people. Um, you weren't sort of biting into another evening or day. Um, it worked out very well. So, are there some, I guess, non negotiables? Are there? Do you have to pass? Um, <laughs> I'm a teacher, so I'm interested in <laughs> the class. At, you know what I mean? So, um, I'm just curious, like how. Because you have led a confirmation, you led the one most recently. Are there things that are you more of a facilitator, or are you kind of looking for certain th- responses? Thing like I, I actually really don't know much at all about this. So no, I, I'm not. I, I, there is no. There is no. There's exam. no rubric. There's no. Um, the, the rubric is that you've covered the subjects with yeah. with folks. If they if they take them on board, they take mm-hmm. them on board. Um, if they if they don't take them on board, and yeah, they're still confirmed. Well, that's on them. Yeah. Um, it's making sure that you've offered up the the basics of what what Christian faith is all about, how churches work, what, what what's in the Bible. If people take them on board, they take them on board. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of it, really, it was the folks that just stuck it out to the end. That we just took them forward to to yeah. confirmation, sent the, sent the uh, the list off to the bishop, who yeah. then turned up and and did the confirmation service. Um, which we did jointly with another church. That's yeah. often the way it happens yeah. these days. Mm-hmm. Or it's done at the cathedral with with uh, and, and a big service there. Right. Um, but no, we we don't we don't sort of beat beat people over the head with an exam or anything like that. No, no. What is the uh, involvement of the bishop in in the actual confirmation process? Or it it, it sounds like. The decision to get confirmed and the initial classes are are fairly uh, local, 
But then when the actual confirmation happens, I, I believe there's a there's a service involved and the service is presided over by by the bishop, who's the, you know, the, the head of the of our region in terms of the church region. Is that right? Yes. Uh, but it, the bishop tends to go round and do do confirmation services um, around his patch. Um, mm. So sometimes he'll be doing them at the cathedral, but sometimes he'll travel around and do do a confirmation around around the patch, as it were. And um, that, in fact, the bishop is doing a, a seminar on oh, it's not a seminar, a sort of session on on com- what confirmation means um, in in Vancouver in, the, in a week or two's time. Actually, it's okay. been advertised. Um, but no, it, it can be local. But as I say, to have enough people to make it worthwhile, you often joined together with several churches. We joined together with Wanuk, um, as, as, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the bishop, because it is the bishop's job to do that. It's one of the things the bishop keeps to himself, um, or he's kept to the, the role of the bishop. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's interesting. One of the things that that is mirrored in the confirmation service, which we haven't talked about, is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when you read back into the the life of the early church in the book of Acts, in the Bible, um, that that role of the coming of the Holy Spirit was central to the early growth of the church. And I remember that when I was confirmed, um, I think it was the Bishop of Sussex or somebody, something like that, came along and um, laid his hands on the heads of the, of the candidates. And I suddenly felt his hands are incredibly hot, very, very warm. And I thought, that's unusual, that's odd. Then after that, I learned that that's often a sign of the the, the Holy Spirit, that warmth in the touch Hmm. of the bishop. And and that that coming of the Holy Spirit into each of us was something very much central to the early church um, and happened to the the early Christians and is, is still happening with people today. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's not the force from Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is a person and is the third person of God. Not easy to understand, but that's that's the way Mm -hmm. of it. Dick, can you talk to us about the topic of being re-baptized? You know, I wasn't baptized in the Anglican Church, um, but I've been confirmed in the Anglican Church. And when I was confirmed, I wasn't, I didn't have to be baptized in the church. My understanding is that you're not supposed to rebaptize. Baptize is like a one and done deal. As long as you're baptized within, as you say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so if you are baptized in the Hindu faith, then <laughs> that's not the same thing. Then we're 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 talking about a different thing. But can you talk a little bit about kind of that that topic overall? Yeah. I think the answer would be a very personal thing. If yes, you may well have been confirmed in a in a in a way in in a different, completely different um, denomination. Yeah. But if you felt that you wanted to, if you like, put a particular stamp on your 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 personality as a as an Anglican, nobody's going to stand in your way if you want to be confirmed. Absolutely not. Um, the only thing. The only thing we ran into when we were doing the most recent confirmation was a person who hadn't been baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and therefore needed to be baptized before they right. were confirmed. But there was somebody else who'd been baptized in, in that way, or, although it wasn't in an Anglican church, so they could go straight to confirmation. Right. So it's just a sort of, uh, I'm not quite sure, sure if it's a silly rule, but that, those are the rules. But there would be some kind of rules around, I imagine, if you want to serve in any more official way, I imagine you have to be, you would have to be confirmed, yes, you'd have right? to be confirmed. Yeah. If you wanted to say, offer yourself to be a deacon, yeah, um, mm-hmm. then yes, you'd have to be confirmed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And why not? But not like council or anything, necessarily. Oh, no. Not in the past at all? That no, you know? I, I think my dog could be a member, member of the council, but you know. <laughs> Dick, come on. That just speaks to <laughs> the importance of what we do. We're more, we're more competent than, the do- than Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one th- one thing that, that that we do do is that we rededicate ourselves 
in a number of, of yes. services through the church year, we yes. rededicate ourselves. And it is that business of, of people leaking <laughs> on, and, and sort of, we are human. We, yeah. we are not. We are not. We don't turn into sort of Christian robots when we when we're confirmed. Yeah, we 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 blunder around in our lives, yeah. and and so rededication a number in a number of ways on Ash Wednesday and a, and a number of other services is really important for us. And well, even even for as the, as the whole church rededicates itself at a baptism. Yeah, and I and I even remember. I don't know if we've done it in the past, but but you know one of the traditions around in baptism services is that the the priest will actually take some of the baptismal water and sprinkle it onto the people. Yes, not not to rebaptize them, but to remind them of their baptism in in a physical way. And I think that is, I mean, I just think that is beautiful uh, and also really important for having the physical reminder of this water that you've been baptized into. And I remember at, um, at St. Aidan, where I first started going to Anglican church and where I was confirmed, the baptismal font was at the back of the church where it's supposed to be technically. Um, and it's there so that you walk by it and you remember your baptism and you you are actually you see it to to remember it, and there would always be water in it, and you would have the opportunity to remind yourself of your baptism by touching the water, and possibly crossing yourself. But that wasn't the requirement. That wasn't the point. I think that helps to remind and assert to people that the idea of baptism is foundational to the Christian identity. And I think just because you're in doesn't mean you don't have to be reminded or don't fail or don't or, and sometimes forget, but what that actually, the significance of that is. Uh, and so for the church to provide regular reminders, whether it's through regular services or through the opportunity of just walking by the font, it's just an important piece of praxis. It's an important practice that the church has um, and Christians have to just keep on doing what they're doing. Um, you have said something about how Ash Wednesday, when if you attend that service, you get the ash cross on your forehead and you you had talked about how that's almost like a, a reminder of your baptism. It's another way of being baptized. And actually, when you said that, that just reminded me that I've actually been thinking a lot about um, the words. I, I didn't attend uh, our Ash Wednesday service because I wasn't able to, but I know that it's the, 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 the phrase, I guess, that goes along with that service is from dust you came to dust you will return. And that those words have really stuck with me in the past month or so that it's been. And I thought that how you kind of touched on when you were talking about the, the symbolism of Jesus's baptism was this dying and resurrecting. That's kind of th- those words from that Ash Wednesday service are another reminder of that. It's the this is where you're from. This is where you're going to go again. But in the meantime, like live well <laughs> um, and remember your, your, your vows. Remember what you've said. And We're in the business of changing lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just to uh, kind of wrap up some of our thoughts here, um, I think the takeaways for me are that if you're a Christian and or you consider yourself a Christian and you haven't been, have not been baptized, it's something that you should think about and and explore. And you should come, uh, you know, if you're coming to St. Matthew's, uh, come and chat with uh, myself or Trevor or, or Dick or, or any any member of the leadership team. Um, some of you uh, who are listening might know that we we don't currently have a priest at St. Matthew's, but we're very happy to announce that we've uh, we have uh, a new priest starting May first. Father James Huang uh, is starting with us uh, on that day. Uh, he'll be our new our new full time priest. So um, if you haven't been out to St. Matthew's or if you haven't been out for a while, uh, come and join us um, uh, the first Sunday after uh, May first. Uh, to uh, to welcome him, and he'll actually be having we'll be we'll be having an induction ceremony for his ministry on May seventh at seven. seven o'clock, I believe, in the evening. 
May 7th is a Tuesday. Yeah. So uh, come out and uh, and join us for that service. Um, it should be a it should be a good time. And and then uh, we you can you can we can have that chat about baptism whether whether you want to be baptized as an adult or uh, baptize uh, a, one of your children. Um, happy to discuss that and to and to kind of explore what that looks like for you or or for that matter uh, confirmation. I th- I believe uh, Dick you we might be we're we're thinking of having a potential confirmation class uh, in the fall. Whereas the in the autumn, as you like to call it, um, yeah, but I've le- I've I'm learning Canadian you're, gradually. You're trying to learn. You're doing very well. I'm very pleased with you. Um, so, uh, and and of course, we'll be looking to have um, uh, Father James um, involved in in that process. I, I expect will be likely. Um, so yeah, uh, please, um, if if you're wondering or you're not sure, even if you don't end up. Thinking, if you end up thinking, you know what, this isn't for me right now, that's fine. We should, I think, having a conversation about it is still important because it's, it isn't, in, baptism is an integral part to the Christian identity. Um, and uh, thinking about it now uh, and talking through about it with someone is, is I think, a, a good, a good option. So thanks for tuning in with us today on Pray Tell. Um, if you have any uh, questions or a topic you'd like us to discuss, um, we'd love to hear from you. You can leave that in the comments below. Um, we started with uh, baptism because it just it was a nice um, topic for us to start off with in the spring here um, after we did our, our Advent series in, in the winter. So if you have any other ideas, please reach out. And if you want us to if you think that we should drink other beers and ciders uh we are gladly hear your comments on that and and go and purchase them mm-hmm. um feel free to suggest any you think would be worthwhile uh for us to uh, uh imbibe and lastly we just want to say thank you to dick for joining us today That's your sure. insight and and commentary was really helpful and enlightening so thanks for making time to join us today you're welcome it's great to have you